The 1960s produced some of the greatest technological feats of the 20th century, and one of them was Concorde. While America was aiming for the moon, Britain and France were reaching for the skies with an airliner that would fly at over 1,300 miles an hour. This project was one of the most challenging ever in civil aviation. And it produced a truly iconic plane, and one that is still capable of creating emotion in people. I remember when I was a student in Reading, right underneath its flight path, hearing the sound of those engines ripping across the sky, seeing this wonderful needle-like shape heading off to exotic locations. But unfortunately, never with me on board. I'm going to be looking at how Concorde pushed the aeronautical boundaries far further than any other airliner had done before. Now, I'm an archaeologist, so I'm normally used to dealing with far more ancient relics than Concorde. So this story is going to be a bit of a departure for me, because not only is it set in the 20th century, but many of the people who designed and built Concorde are still alive today. So meeting and chatting with them is something I'm really looking forward to. I'm also going to be looking around Alpha Foxtrot, the last Concorde ever built at its final resting place in Bristol and using computer-generated images to get inside parts of it that you never normally see. The origins of supersonic flight came just after the Second World War, when engineers were keen to push planes to higher and higher speeds. Before that, the closest that planes had got to breaking the sound barrier was when they were in near-vertical dives. And at those speeds, the pilots experienced such incredible handling difficulties that some people thought that this was one barrier that would never be broken. But it finally was in 1947 by an American, Chuck Yeager. Soon after, Britain was developing supersonic fighters like the Lightning. And from here, the next logical thing to do was to make airliners that would break the sound barrier. The first problem in designing a supersonic airliner is deciding the shape of the wings. So this one is Professor Ted Talbot worked on some of the first British wing designs. And you can see there that um, <clears throat> there's been nothing flying like that ever. That's a very weird shape, isn't it? It is, isn't it, yes. That's the 1st of February, 19... 19- 57. Yes. I, d- I didn't realise that the origins of, of supersonic civil transport went back over 50 years. Oh, they'd been whispered for a long time, and uh, the first f- formal meeting called by the Ministry of Supply was in November of 1956. So it's got this peculiar sort of W-shaped yes. wing. If, if we had the wing uh, continuous like that all the way back, it would be touching on the ground at takeoff. Right. <laughs> Which isn't advisable. So the thing to do was to put these kinks in it and bring everything around the centre of gravity, right. like that. So would that have flown? Uh, <laughs> you seem a bit hesitant you, about that. <laughs> well, I am. Yes, it would have flown. Uh, whether it would have been uh, useful as a, as a, a passenger aircraft, I don't know. Right. So this never got beyond this stage, oh, no, did it? No, no, no. We didn't like it anyway. By the early 60s, the designers had moved away from the more unusual and settled on the Delta Wing for their supersonic airline. At this time, the English, French, Russians and Americans were all scrambling to develop their own supersonic airliners. To try and be the first in the air, an Anglo-French agreement was signed in 1962 to pool their resources and build Concorde. Many of the designs for Concorde were drawn at Filton in Bristol. Alan Perry was a draftsman right at the start of the project, working on the wings of the prototype. One thing I find very difficult looking at something like Concorde is is trying to get get my head round the idea that it was built before the age of computer design, that you actually had to sit and draw everything out and experiment. 
that was the only way that we could actually do the design work. And certainly the um, paper design lent itself to paper models. If you could produce a cardboard model of the thing in three dimensions and people could look at it, you know, from different views, um, uh, this was a great help. Right, OK, let's see if it flies. That's pretty good. Not bad. I'm impressed. The landing wasn't too brilliant, <laughs> no, was it? No, no. It, it was quite it was common fun. to see us up behind the Brabazon hangar, up on the slope, uh, throwing small models made out of um, used uh, time cards that people used to clock on. I think we ought to have another test flight another in a minute, test but flight. I'm still really impressed see, yeah. by the fact that you use things like this <laughs> yes. to design that. Well, I'm a great believer in three-dimensional modelling, and um, I created a, 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 a title for it. It was Very Low Technology Virtual Reality. <laughs> This was something I enjoyed. Always have, always will. You know, that uh, you can uh, take something so ordinary as a piece of cardboard or a piece of paper and make something out of it, which is um, useful and uh, contributes to the project. People tend to think of designing something like a plane as being just a pure science, don't they? But do you think there's a bit more of, a, of an art in it as well? Well, I always felt there was uh, certainly a, an artistic... Um, element in in what we did i think possibly because of the shape of the airplane the art form came across quite easily i defy anyone to look at concord and not marvel at the shapes that they'll see oh look at that better B brilliant better brilliant After the wing designs were drawn, the next stage was to put scale models into a wind tunnel. Over 300 different shapes were tried out, with much of this testing being done at Filton. Mike Marsden worked in the wind tunnels, developing and refining Concorde's delta wings. Because a basic delta the is basic a triangle delta shape, isn't it? it? would look something like that. But a, a much better shape for flying supersonically is what we call a slender delta, which is much longer and has much less wingspan, so it might look something like that. And a variation on that would be what's called a, a, a gothic delta, which would look a little bit like that. And this is shaped like a gothic arch. I was say, we're getting very architectural here. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and another variation is the OG which looks a bit like an upside-down wine glass. Right. The slender delta and the, the OG both look quite promising. And in the end, the, the OG was rather better in terms of balance. Because presumably you've got, to, you've got to get to a balance, haven't you, between something that's going to go very, very fast, if you want to make it go yes. supersonic, yes. and something that is going to be stable and, and handle well. That's right, yes. And also yes. land. And because... take off and land, yes, that's right. Um, and that was the major problem, of course. Uh, th this OG wing's ideal for flying supersonically, but it's, it's on the face of it, it's not a very wonderful thing for low speed, for taking off and landing. But it was found that if you gave it a very sharp leading edge, that's... Uh, this bit here, you could make it work. With this very sharp leading edge, it's quite different. They, they tore the rule book up, if you like, and uh, the, the, the airflow is, is quite different, it behaves quite differently. If this is the leading edge of, of Concorde and the air's coming up here, it yeah. can go underneath quite happily, yeah. but it can't follow this sharp leading edge yeah. round here, and it lifts away, it breaks away, and we call this separated flow, and it separates like that. The separated flow coming off the leading edge of Concorde's wings joins together to create low-pressure vortices above each wing. It's these that give Concorde its lift at low speeds. A major concern for Concorde's wing designers was how these vortices would behave in a crosswind particularly at slow speeds like takeoff and landing. Their biggest fear was that a crosswind would cause a vortex to detach, 
meaning that the wing would instantly lose lift. To see if these fears were founded, many more tests were done, and a small plane was built to see how Delta wings reacted at low speeds. Eventually, the designers' fears were put to rest, and they were reassured that Concorde's wings wouldn't suddenly lose lift at low speeds. The clever thing with Concorde is you've got this shape which is pretty good for flying su supersonically, and the same shape without any change in geometry can give you enough lift just about it's not very wonderful it, it does the job though give you enough lift for landing and takeoff so after ideas models redesigns and thousands of hours of testing concord finally had safe effective wings but they're just one of the problems that you've got to overcome when you're building a supersonic airliner <laughs> 